What's up, PowerShell fam? Hope you are staying safe and healthy and enjoying the first day of PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit so far. I'm sure future me is enjoying right there with you, and hopefully he shows up in the chat to interact with you folks too. So my talk is entitled CM Smackdown, Battle of the Configuration Managers, and I'll be covering, comparing, contrasting three contenders here, DSC, Puppet, and Ansible. So let's get into it. Firstly, let's cover the agenda so you know what you're getting yourself into. I'll start by introducing myself and configuration managers and why every organization I believe needs them. Then we'll go into each configuration manager one by one, DSC, Puppet, and Ansible. And I'll walk you through some of the general concepts in the architecture. I'll also present you with some pros and cons of each approach based on my experience. Then I'll walk you through some code in a demo to show you what it looks like when these configuration managers actually work to apply changes and maintain state. Now that code will of course be available for you to try out for yourselves later in a repo for Summit. And finally, we'll wrap with some conclusions based on my walkthrough with you and some recommendations based on your individual use case. Now just a level set for you, this is an all levels talk and more of an overview with some real life examples and recommendations. So if the material isn't as in depth as you'd like, don't worry. Good news is I'll provide some links to resources along the way and in a repo to help you dive deeper. But my main goal here is by the end to help you make an informed decision about which configuration manager you or your organization should explore further for your needs. Sounds good? Let's dive in. So who's this little guy sitting in the corner? So I'm Adil Ligari. I've been a sysadmin for about 15 years, and I'm super passionate about PowerShell and automation. I'm also randomly the resident PowerShell sticker artist, so you've probably seen one of my PowerShell stickers on a laptop or in a conference somewhere. But the most relevant role for this talk is my day job. I am a senior solutions engineer at Chocolatey Software. And so I work with customers daily who are integrating Chart Chocolatey for business offering, C4B with their configuration management tooling. So a big part of my day job is understanding a customer's use case and making recommendations based on those needs. And that's exactly the rationale for choosing these three configuration managers today. Of the organizations that approach us for C4B that have or are considering a configuration manager, upwards of about 80% of those reference one of these three tools specifically. So that's the trend we see in the industry and the rationale behind picking these three. So one of the first logical questions that comes up is, why use a configuration manager anyway? Well, plenty of reasons, but I'll list some here. Firstly, you can declaratively state your configuration, so you only need to define your end state. So what that means is, instead of defining the 10 steps required to set up a web server hosting a site on port 8080, I can just declare in a configuration that I want a web server hosting a site on port 8080, and let the configuration manager figure out the heavy lifting of how it makes that happen. Coupled with this is the idea of idempotence. So configuration managers are idempotent by nature, so they only introduce a change when a change is needed. When there's no change needed, no change is made to the system. Additionally, you can speak the domain-specific language of the tool, or the DSL, and that's meant to be simple and human-readable, and you're just declaring or stating out your configuration or your desired state, uh, and you're letting the configuration manager tooling simply make it so by abstracting away the lower layers of code and logic. In addition to that, managing configuration drift automatically is a really big feature of configuration managers. So when you have a setting that goes out of line over time, if somebody accidentally installs something or changes a setting to break a system, then the configuration manager can rerun that configuration document and reapply that state or remediate that change to make the system functional again and to maintain the desired state that you've specified. Okay, so let's hop into DSC first as our first configuration manager. Now, DSC is a management and maintenance platform more than it is a tool. It has tooling that you can build on top of it in a lot of ways, and that's where the PowerShell comes in. So it's written in PowerShell and it's built into the operating system itself, so you don't have any additional things to install. It's right in there, and you can run start DNC configuration as soon as you have a configuration file and you're ready to go. In addition to that, it's configuration as code, of course. You are defining your config, you're configuring it, and then you're deploying it and you're managing it all within DSC. It is, of course, declarative and idempotent by nature, as I mentioned before, and it consists of three main components. So let's talk about them. The first component, in its basic level is a configuration. So configuration is essentially a PowerShell script where you're defining your desired state. 
the end result of what you want. So this site set up on this port, this feature installed, that's what you're defining. Your resources, you can think of them as your modules. So the underlying code that makes it so. The underlying code that actually figures out the logic and the checking behind making your declarative state happen. And the local configuration manager is the actual execution engine that runs on your endpoint OS. So that's what on your endpoints would actually execute the code to perform the changes required for your configuration state to be maintained. So let's look at this in a diagram. So we have Amy the admin here. She's got her DSC laptop and she's written some configuration files here. So she's got her configurations written in PowerShell here and now she wants to be able to apply them. So she can simply run on her endpoints a start DSC configuration in a push model and just be able to point to her configs and have those endpoint nodes be configured based on the configuration document that she's defined. The other approach is a pull model. So Amy could instead set up a pull server, a DSC pull server, and she could upload her configurations into the DSC pull server and define in those configs the nodes that she wants to target. Now, the pull server with those configurations and combined with the resources on the endpoints, as well as the local configuration manager on these endpoints, that will check in on a schedule and pull down the configuration for that individual node, and the local configuration manager will actually execute that on the endpoint and use the providers like SIM to actually execute the code to perform those tasks to maintain that state. So let's get into the pros of DSC first of all. Big one, because we're here on PowerShell Summit, you get to write in PowerShell. So you have a good familiarity with that language, of course, and it's easy to assist in troubleshooting because you understand the code. So that's a real plus. In addition to that, DSC resources abound on the PowerShell gallery. So if you check the DSC resource kit box on the PowerShell gallery, you'll see plenty of resources available there for you already. So you don't need to reinvent that wheel so much. Also, it's native and built into the OS. So no additional installers that I'm putting on top of there, which is great. And also, if you're going down the path of Azure automation, uh, and you have a lot of your VM infrastructure in Azure, you can install the PowerShell DSC extension on your VMs in Azure and then enable Azure Automation to be your pull server. So that can act as your pull server where you store your configs and your endpoint nodes being the Azure VMs can pull down their configuration and then apply it to maintain your desired state on your endpoint VMs. Also, of course, DSC is extensible. It is that platform. So you can build your own tooling on top of it. You can build your own resources. If you want to customize DSC resources, let's say for your organization, they're not doing exactly what you want them to, you can go into the underlying code and edit it to change it to be perform it in the way that you want it to be. In addition, you can get fancy and you can define composite resources if you wanted some or composite configurations, if you wanted some granular management, like you wanted this node to inherit this config from here and this config from somewhere else, then that can get a little bit complicated, but you can definitely do that. So the ability is there, the capability in DSC, but that leads into naturally one of the big cons. So you may have to end up writing a lot of PowerShell with DSC. And part of the challenge is if you want to customize your resources or if you want to customize your composite configurations, or if you want to incorporate hierarchical data or data-driven configuration, like you're separating your configuration from your configuration data, that can get a little bit tricky in DSC. It's not driven that way by nature. Uh, Gail Colas has a, um, a module called Datum that you can check out. So get, check out Gail's module if you have a sec. Uh, I can definitely uh, drop a link in the chat. Hopefully future me will do that. So that's one way to approach it. Uh, and, and again, going down this line of heavy customization can affect the sustainability of your product. So at the end of the day, if you're using DSC heavily and you're customizing it heavily, you know, you're at PowerShell Summit, so you're probably one of the people who understands it well, but possibly the rest of your team doesn't. So if the rest of your team can't cross-train and backfill for you, then that really affects the sustainability of, of a long-term solution for your organization. Also, there's going to be a move to class-based resources, so there may be some compatibility issues in the future um, if you have configurations defined using the old methods. And one of the last things I'll mention here for cons is it lacks some native functionality in other solutions. So though the other tooling here in this space, specifically Puppet and Ansible, both have paid solutions that feature a dashboard 
um, and additional functionality that's value adds. So role-based access control is one. Um, API level integrations is another, a robust server along with a web dashboard that you can actually interact with. These are some of the features that are available in the paid versions of those tools that are not available on DSC. Let's talk about Puppet now. So Puppet is a configuration management tool as well, and it's probably the oldest one in the bunch. It was born circa 2005, so it's definitely one of the more mature um, offerings. It uh, adopts a client-server architecture, so there's a defined server and clients that communicate with it using the Puppet agent. It's written mostly in Ruby uh, with some C++ and Clojure. That's happened over time. Uh, specifically, I believe the Puppet server and the Puppet DB um, products are now written in C++ and Clojure. It operates under a Puppet DSL, so you would write your domain-specific language in Puppet DSL, and it's based on Ruby. You can also develop for Puppet based on the PDK, the Puppet Development Kit, as well as the VS Code extension if you find that to be easier. Puppet is open source, so there's an open source version of Puppet, which is Apache licensed, and there's also a Puppet Enterprise version, which adds some features for you. And we'll talk through that in a second. It's platform agnostic as well. So you can run it in Linux, you can run it in Unix-like environments like Mac OS X, you can run it in Windows. It is declarative and idempotent, as we've mentioned with all the other solutions, and specifically the components of a Puppet Run are manifests and facts that combine together and make catalogs that apply on every run, and then reports that come out of those. So let's walk through that in a diagram. So here's my Puppet server up here, and specifically this Puppet server has Puppet code on it, which I've defined, those manifests up there, and in addition to that, there's Hira. So Hira is the Puppet product that gives you that sort of configuration data level hierarchy and inheritance so you can set up roles and you can have more complicated sort of composite configurations that we were trying to do in, in DSC. So that's natively supported with a tool like Hira. Gives you the ability to have more complex infrastructure definitions. So how does an actual run kick off and how does it work? So we have our manifests up there at the top that are defined. Um, so that's the configuration declarative state that we've written. So our site.pp file, let's say that manifest uh, of what we want to be on this endpoint over here uh, at the bottom. And so we have Puppet Agent running at the bottom there too. Now specifically Factor as a part of Puppet Agent will push facts up to the Puppet server first. The Puppet server will take the facts that it took from the endpoint. So um, facts like the OS architecture and other details to see what state it's in now and it combines that with the manifests of what it wants to do or the state it wants to maintain on that server or endpoint. And then it combines those two to form a catalog. A catalog is a JSON file essentially that goes down into the Puppet agent on the client and the Puppet agent uses that catalog to define exactly what changes it's gonna make on the client. And once that client endpoint has performed those changes, it pushes up a report, which is then consumable by you. Um, and brought up into the Puppet server and, of course, also stored in the Puppet database, the Puppet DB there. So this is a very basic explanation. We can get deeper into the weeds, but it's good enough for this presentation to understand the basics of a Puppet run and how it functions. Now, this is your generic open source Puppet as well as uh, Enterprise. With Enterprise, of course, you buy yourself some additional features. So. What do you get with it? So firstly, you get that web dashboard built into Puppet Server. So you in Puppet Enterprise, you have the ability to have a little bit more advanced data and reporting. Uh, you have role-based access control and even Active Directory integration. You have the API with integration possibilities and you have better orchestration features. And when we talk about orchestration, uh, we're talking about CD for PE. So that's the, their continuous delivery product. So if you are in the software development business, then you can actually also use the CD for EPE product to help with your build, deploy, and test phases of your software development as well. So that's included as a product, uh, as a part of Puppet Enterprise. In addition, there's deeper support for cloud native applications, so, so deeper support for connection into Azure, uh, AWS, or GCP, and as well, deeper support for containers um, in the Puppet Enterprise version. And of course, when we talk about support, you actually do have support with the Puppet Enterprise version, which is very useful. In my humble opinion, Puppet is definitely one of the more complex configuration management tools to set up, so I 
really would recommend you go towards Puppet Enterprise if you are considering Puppet because then you get the benefit of that support to help you out if you run into any trouble in the configuration and setup. So let's talk about some Puppet Pros. It is a mature tool set. I mean, it's been around for 16 years, so definitely you have the robustness of a tool that's developed over time. Uh, it offers you better scalability. So the Puppet Agent being installed on each endpoint means that the agent is doing the heavy lifting. So when the Puppet server issues a task, it can issue that run to a thousand machines and they will just run that fine because the agent is the one that's doing the hard work on that end. So it's very scalable in that manner as compared to some agentless solutions like Ansible. It's great for complex environments. As we said, high res integrated in there. So if you have these complex configurations or um, and hierarchical configurations, it's going to be able to natively support that. So it's going to be able to have you be able to define different roles and have your endpoint nodes have adopt multiple roles even if they need to. Of course, it has crop platform and hybrid support. So not only does it support Windows, Unix, like Linux environments, it also supports cloud and on-prem infrastructure in a hybrid fashion. It has advanced enterprise features, of course. So Puppet Enterprise or PE gives you those advanced features that we went through in the last slide. It's also great for change management and testing, as we talked about through CD for PE. And in addition, also, if you really need agentless, if you can't install the Puppet agent on an endpoint and you need to fix something, then you can also use Puppet Bolt. So Puppet Bolt supports ad hoc execution. So you could run a Puppet Bolt task from a place where you have Puppet Bolt onto an endpoint that doesn't have any Puppet tooling on it just yet. So let's talk about the cons. So the first one is a big one, and it's easy to see from some of the stuff that I've explained. It is definitely the most complicated tool set of the configuration managers I'm covering today. And that's because there's such an advanced level of tooling and features available. And that means that it can get a little confusing uh, when you have so many different features, you don't know which to choose or which to uh, take advantage of in the Puppet Enterprise tool set specifically. Um, it is a Ruby DSL. I count that as a little bit of a con because personally, I'm not as adept at Ruby as I am at PowerShell and certain other languages. So I find that domain specific language not as easily readable as some of the other uh, defined languages like even the PowerShell DSL and of course the uh, also the Ansible YAML playbooks. In addition to that, there is some customization required and that's where I really say that PE is something that you need to lean on for Puppet Enterprise. If you want to get it up and running well, you want the uh, enterprise support. Uh, it's also a, definitely a heavier footprint. So the Puppet agent on those endpoints does run Ruby. So um, Ruby is a little bit more of a uh, resource intensive application. So generally it requires a little more memory and, and uh, CPU consumption than, than other languages natively. Also speaking of load, there's a higher initial cognitive load. So there's actually more burden on you to try and figure this out when you first start. So what I refer to that as is a steeper learning curve initially. So you really need to wrap your hand around some of the uh, paradigms of configuration management that Puppet uses and, re and really think in the Puppet manner in order to understand some of the tooling that Puppet has available to you. So that can be a little hard to do initially at least and it will take some time for you to get used to Puppet in terms of its language and its DSL and all the different features available. And of course, the last point uh, is that the advanced feature set, uh, the dashboard, the API, all the reporting and stuff is available only in PE, so there is a cost to that. So moving on to Ansible, our third contender here. Ansible is an open source configuration management tool that was developed in 2012. It has an enterprise version. Um, it's called the Ansible Automation Platform. It was formerly known as Tower, and it has some additional tooling, just like the Puppet Enterprise version. It is agentless and cross-platform. So this is a real distinction here. So it runs on the native communication mechanisms built into the OS. So, so on Linux, that's going to be SSH on Linux, your Unix, for the connection method. And the connection method on Windows is going to be WinRM. So both native and built into the OS. And it is written in Python. So that is usually a language that's a little easier to interpret, although I still prefer PowerShell. But the good news is all the Windows modules written in Ansible are actually PowerShell based. So if you open those up and you look at the source code, it's actually PowerShell scripts that are being run via Python and PyWinRM and the connection to those endpoints. So it's declarative and idempotent, just like all the other configuration management tooling. And also the domain specific language it uses is YAML. 
which is YAML ain't a markup language. It's actually a recursive acronym. Um, and you've probably run across YAML before in other DevOps and automation tools. And so it has playbooks, which it uses to define these configurations. That's your declarative state. Uh, then you have host files for your inventory and you have roles, uh, which are collections of essentially modules um, and different ways that you can do it, much like a PowerShell module, Ansible modules work in the same way as in their collections of, of scripts and ways to do things in the underlying code base. That basically the modules and the roles are the level that gets abstracted away from you when you declare your state. Okay, so let's look at Ansible through a diagram as well. So we have Amy, our admin again, and now she has an Ansible sticker on because she's using an Ansible machine. And this is an important distinction because Ansible has to run on a Linux control node, so you can't run it on Windows. But the good news is you can use Windows subsystem for Linux or even a Docker container if you want to to run your actual playbooks. So she's defined her Ansible directory here. And this Ansible directory contains playbooks, modules, collections, hosts, and roles. So uh, the playbook is where she's defining her config. Like I said before, the modules are similar to PowerShell modules. That's where you're abstracting away the underlying code to actually perform the commands. Collections are actually groups of modules. So Chocolatey has a collection, by the way, called Chocolatey Chocolatey, and that's what we do there is we use that uh, collection of modules together um, to sort of give the user a bundle that they can use to, to, to abstract away some of the code and perform some underlying functions. And a host file, of course, is just her inventory. And the roles are also ways that she can collect playbooks and collections and modules together to sort of perform orchestrated steps on multiple endpoints. So she's got her folder. She's got her directory with all of the different playbooks and pieces of Ansible set up. And she runs her Ansible control in mode. Let's say it's in WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux. And she just pushes out the commands to run this playbook and that playbook then connects via WinRM, runs the actual underlying code. If it's Windows machines, it's going to run actual PowerShell code. If it's uh, if it's Linux machines, of course, it's going to run the underlying Bash or Python code in order to perform those steps. And so that's one approach. The second approach is, of course, she can commit that repository or that directory into a GitHub repository or a source control repository. So once it's up there, now her infrastructure is actually code. So she's got committed it and she's using versioning and she's using a proper repository for that. She can maybe even collaborate with her peers. And so now what that opens up is Ansible Automation Platform or Tower, formerly Tower, um, now can consume from those repositories. So the way that you edit playbooks on Ansible Tower is actually only through repositories. So that's a direct link. So she has to follow uh, coding conventions and best practices for CI CD in order to even commit a playbook up here, which is kind of great. So Ansible Automation Platform is going to take the project for that repository and pull it in and allow her to now use the web dashboard that's built into Ansible Automation Platform or Tower and give her the ability to define and drop down and select her playbooks that she wants to run to define a separate inventory, maybe even credentials that she wants to add in there, uh, as well as other surveys and other functions that are built in uh, to Ansible Automation Platform. We'll touch on that in a sec. And so Ansible Automation Platform is, of course, going to be the, the mechanism then, the server that pushes out the actual configurations to the endpoints then. So this way that a Amy's removed herself from having to run a Ansible control node locally, she's pushing it up to the repo and the repo is being uh, merged over into Ansible Automation Platform and then the task can be run from the web dashboard, which is a much easier and friendlier UI to be used. Now, Ansible Automation Platform is of course part of the paid feature set. There is an open source upstream of it called AWX, it's fine to run and generally will work okay. It's a little bit tough to upgrade sometimes and that it may not keep all your configs when you upgrade it. And it's definitely not something I recommend for production. So I would definitely go down the platform of contacting Red Hat to see if you can acquire uh, an Ansible automation platform license uh, for that use case. Um, so specifically, what do you get with that? You get a web dashboard, of course, that I mentioned before. Um, you get an API again with some integrations similar to Puppet. You get role-based access control. You get an inventory 
um, that's supported in there so you can define different inventories and you can um, group inventories together in, in more complex ways. You get the ability to schedule runs. So you can schedule runs to happen at different times uh, instead of having to run cron jobs locally or have to schedule it in some other manner. You, of course, get more advanced reporting with the web dashboard and Ansible automation platform. And part of that role-based access control I didn't mention before was also the ability to have credentialing. So the credentials are encrypted and stored within Tower itself for Ansible automation platform. So let's go through the pros and cons for Ansible as well. So one of the first pros, of course, is this agent list. So very minimal footprint, great to, ins great to not have to install additional tooling onto your endpoints. It uses the native remoting and code, so WinRM and PowerShell, so nice and easy. So it's really easy to set up. This is a big one, folks. So I will say, in my humble opinion, of all the tools I've used, Ansible is probably the quickest to get up and running and get functional in that I have had of any of the configuration manager experiences. And that's just my opinion. In addition, it is pipeline ready. So it's so lightweight that it can actually run in CI CD pipelines. As long as you install Ansible in there, you can actually have that execute playbooks on the fly. And what that opens up as well is supporting an ephemeral container use case. So you can, in fact, spin up Docker containers on the fly, install Ansible on that Docker container via the Docker file, and then pull in your playbook, run your task, and then destroy the container. You don't even need any long running containers or long running Linux nodes around at all. And Josh Duffney has some good notes on this. I'll mention his book later as well called Become Ansible. Also, Ansible supports the majority of networking appliances. So Cisco, Infoblox, Palo Alto, a lot of these uh, networking appliances that are out there, these companies, they have native Ansible automation certified collections up on Red Hat Ansible automation platform. So you can use those. A lot of networking folks have been using Ansible for a, a long time specifically for this reason because it has very robust networking playbooks and collections. And of course, the advanced feature set with Ansible automation platform is a big win. If you're going to use that in production, I definitely recommend going down that route. Now the cons, of course. And of course, if you're noticing the pattern, the pros are often the cons as well. So it is agentless, uh, so it's not always so scalable. So you are limited to the resources on your control and order server because that is actually what's running the commands. You don't have any agent running on the endpoints. So I believe the default thread count is five, but you can definitely increase that. But just recognize that that's going to be limited uh, to eventually the resources available on your control node or your server. So and you're even on your Ansible automation platform tower server, um, if you have limited CPU memory or bandwidth, then that's going to eventually run you into some limitations of amount of that you can scale your your tasks and your job templates. So YAML is space sensitive. This is a bit of a calm for me. Now it's much better now because of VS Code extensions and Vim linting. Uh, so you don't have that many problems anymore. But you do have to remember that even if you add an extra space on a line, sometimes that will bring down the whole job template and it won't work. So be mindful of that. Of course, it requires a Linux control node, so that's a little bit of a con because we're used to having the tool work cross-platform, and in this case, you definitely do require a Linux control node. Um, but the good news is you can run that in Windows Subsystem for Linux or even a container, as mentioned before. And of course, that advanced feature set with Ansible Automation Platform, that's going to cost you some dollars to do. So that is a little bit of a con. All right, so now that we've covered all these different pros and cons of these tools and mentioned these configuration managers, now let's actually dig in and see some of these features running live. All right, so let's take a look at some of these domain-specific languages or DSLs that are meant to be human-readable, um, where we're going to define our desired state in all these different environments. So I have three VMs here, a uh, DSC VM I'm showing you now, and then an, a, a Puppet VM, and then an Ansible VM, and we'll show you each environment and the DSL for each. So starting with here, I'm comparing apples to apples, so the commands that I'm running and the tasks and the declarative state I want is the same in each environment. Uh, so it is the Chocolatey for Business tool set. So I'm using the Chocolatey resource or provider in each of the different tools to set up Chocolatey for Business. So essentially, I'll walk you through what that means. So on this node localhost, I'm first defining this configuration which is install chocolate. So first of all, the configuration up here is just another special word for function uh, in the PowerShell world. So it's specifically dealing with DSC. So my function and my configuration that I'm defining is install Chaco. 
And then import DSC resource is the same as your import module sort of command uh, in the PowerShell world. And uh, CChaco is the one that I'm using. So I'm telling it to use the commands from this resource available. Uh, Node no is localhost. So of course, I'm doing this on localhost. I'm installing Chocolatey first of all. Uh, that's my first step. So I'm using a local repository for that raw repository and a script to install Chocolatey locally so I don't even reach out to the website. And then I'm setting up my internal NuGet repository here. So that's the C Choco source resource that I'm using there. And I'm saying that I want this to be present. And of course, this depends on the install Chaco command up here working properly. So the rest won't run it because it depends on that. Then the community repository, the public repo. Um, um, so I'm disabling the Chocolatey community repository by stating that I want it to be absent. Uh, then I'm installing the license package here. I'm installing the Chocolatey licensed extension. Uh, and then I'm going through here. And this is actually an installer set. So I'm installing multiple packages at the same time. And then I just go through and set all these Chaco features. You can see this is the Chocolatey C Chaco resource that I'm using, the DSC resource to configure all this stuff. And I also have a C Chaco config here. So down here, I'm checking into central management. This is the last piece. Because we have a web dashboard built into our Chocolatey for Business feature set, I actually have the ability to log into the web dashboard here. And I have my DSC configuration actually configuring, checking into this. Uh, web dashboard. So over here, you can see in the computer view, I just have the server checking into itself. Hopefully by the end of this run, this DSC run, then I'll have this VM1 DSC checking in as well. So we can go ahead and kick this configuration off here uh, by running that command at the bottom, that start DSC configuration. I'll just hit play up here. And this is going to kick off the configuration run. And you can see it's already started and it's already started installing Chocolatey as well. So that's great. So we'll let this run and I'll hop over to the Puppet VM now just to show you what this looks like. So there's a site.pp file. I'm going to slide over to VS Code just so you can see this a little easier. And so this is what it looks like here. So in here, obviously, we're defining first in this site.pp. This is a manifest file in Puppet, by the way. Um, we're defining our package provider right at the top with this Chocolatey. And over here, I'm going through and I'm saying install Chocolatey from this internal URL, much like I was doing in DSC. And then over here, I'm saying I want the latest version. And then I'm just defining those configs here in the domain-specific language. Again, this is the Puppet DSL that I'm defining this in. Now I'm setting up my Chocolatey sources using the Chocolatey source module here. So you can see specifically the Chocolatey source is Chocolatey and I want it to be absent. So I'm removing the community repository and then I'm adding my own internal NuGet repository here, much like I was doing on the other tool, setting the priority to one. And so again, Choco features I'm enabling here. I'm ensuring my license directory, installing my license as I did there before, uh, and then I'm installing some more packages down here and getting some functionality going. Now, I bears mentioning that 7-zip and Notepad++ get installed in all of these functions. Um, so we will see those tools show up here in the context menu, 7-zip and Notepad++. In fact, if we check over with DSC now, um, it's still running. So when that's done, you'll see those things pop up. And of course, we're checking into central management and we're going to see this VM in the dashboard as well, much like the other tools. So let's go in here to the proper directory, first of all. So I believe I was in documents. And we'll list out and we'll see that we have site.pp. Excellent. So now I can run a puppet apply dash T and pass it the manifest file, which is site.pp. And this is the puppet agent running locally. And it's going to kick off and start working through my tasks here. So last bit of code in this marathon here. So you saw how DSC approaches configurations in that PowerShell manner that you understand. You've seen this DSL for Puppet that's used, the Puppet DSL, and it's all pretty readable so far. Uh, now we'll move over to the YAML playbook that uh, is used in Ansible. So same sort of playbook configuration uh, I'm, that I'm declaring out my state with, setting up Chocolatey for Business. Again, over here, I define the collections at the top. So these are those groups of modules together to make things easier. And Chocolatey actually has its own collection, which is Ansible certified, by the way. Um, and it, the Ansible Windows collection is built into Ansible. So, uh, But I am I'm referencing that collection because it's a good best practice to do that whenever you define your, that in your playbook. You can also define a requirements.yml file in the collections folder, alternatively, if you want to. But I like to be explicit in my playbooks. Now up here, I'm just defining some variables because I don't want to have to define them later. I can pass these at runtime as extra vars as well. Basically, some of the packages I'm installing, some of the features and settings that I'm changing here. 
Now, in the actual playbook, I do kind of like YAML, not for the spaces issue that I've mentioned before, but just how easy it is to read. This is definitely one of my favorite DSLs with Ansible for sure. So, you know, I'm installing Chocolatey first of all, name Chocolatey. I'm, I'm, these are my fully qualified collection names here. I'm using Win Chocolatey module for that. And so I'm installing Chocolatey there. And then I'm also removing the Chocolatey community repository. And of course, adding the internal repo. You've seen this before already a couple of times now. Uh, and so I'm creating a directory for that license and I'm just throwing the license file in there. In addition, uh, I'm installing the licensed extension and some other Chocolatey packages here. Down here, I'm turning on some features for self-service, et cetera, that I did in the other part. And of course, here is where I'm checking it into central management, setting those URLs and defining those central management features. So we have the other methods kicking off. The way that I'm going to do this specifically for Ansible is I'm actually going to use Ansible Tower. So let's slide over into that. Here I am on Ansible Tower, or the Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform, as we call it now. And I'm sure you've noticed one of these things is not like the other. I'm actually using the web dashboard in the case of Ansible to be able to deploy those playbooks and those job templates. And that's no mistake there, folks. That's because that was the easiest one to actually be able to set up for a demo. So that should tell you a little bit about how it compares to the other tools in terms of setup. So here I am in Tower, the web dashboard. I can show you the project itself here. So the project is where we're pulling like Amy, the admin did from that GitHub repository. So this is my Ansible GitHub repository where I had the code that I showed you over there before. The Ansible setup C4B playbook is in that project. And so over here, you have the ability to define your inventories, so your hosts. So in the chocolate inventory, I actually have my host of my Ansible VM set up here, VM3 Ansible. And I can even define credentials here. So I have a Windows credential defined in here that's encrypted and secured. And so here's my job template called Setup Chocolatey for Business. I can click on this and you can see I have defined values here already. So specifically, it's using that Chocolatey inventory. And once I connect that GitHub project, the Ansible GitHub, I have the ability now to have this drop down and pick any of the playbooks that are in that repository. So. I picked Setup C4B, and I'm using that Windows credential to connect to my endpoint, by the way, uh, which is useful. I can define a credential here. I can even prompt for some of these settings on launch by ticking those boxes. As we mentioned before, the forks, by default, they are five. That's how many threads are running at the same time. You can increase that number, but of course, reminder that, you, that you're obviously limited by the resources on your Ansible Automation Platform machine. Down here, we can add extra variables to this playbook if you wanted to. So at runtime, you can override some of the variables in your playbook by adding them as extra variables here. So a cool little bit piece of functionality available there. I'm going to go ahead and click launch here and then catch up with some of the other platforms that we've been running on here. So let's hop back over and take a look at DSC and Puppet. So here's my DSC VM. We can see here that that configuration job took 119 seconds. So not bad at all. And that configured from beginning to end all of the Chocolatey features, installing Chocolatey and installing those additional packages. And now assuming that all ran okay, I should be able to open up a PowerShell window here and go ahead and issue the Choco command and see that I have Chocolatey installed and even Chocolatey for Business configured, which is great. So nice and useful. If I do a Choco list with a local only, I can even see that I have packages installed here, which is great. So it did its job there. This configuration were applied at state. Now over here on my dashboard, if I refresh here, I can see that my DSC VM has checked in. In fact, Puppet was as well has checked in. So we'll take a look at DSC and you can see you have those packages listed there. So nice, it is checking in and reporting its status okay. Even the Puppet VM is doing that as well. So we've jumped the gun a little bit, but that's already there as well. So that's great, very functional. Everything's working so far. In a demo, the demo gods are smiling on me today. So I appreciate it. Now over here in the Puppet environment, we can see that this ran and took about 218 seconds. So not bad, not bad in terms of runs at all. And so the great thing about this is with either of these environments, if I rerun the same command, it's going to make no change. That's the idempotent nature of these tools. So I could go back to the DSC VM here again and run the same command as well. And it will basically uh, no op all the way through. So make no changes and finish quite quickly, I bet. If I give it a second so I can see the puppet is loading the facts now, the puppet agent. So we'll hop back here and this shouldn't take too long at all to apply all the different things because they've already been applied. So there you go. That's all completed. And over here, you can see the puppet run again is running through and not going to make any change either. So let's take a look at the Ansible environment. Okay, so we can see here the Ansible run just completed. 
and that took from 10 16 to 10 19 so a little bit longer for that one but not too bad and so we have chocolatey central management and chocolatey central management deployments enabled here each step here you can see if you actually click on the run it will show you a json output of exactly what happened on that run as well so very useful in this dashboard so this run ran successfully as well so these states have been maintained by all our different platforms so let's hop in and actually see that we can also right click a file now and we have the context menu search 7 zip in it notepad plus plus so that got set up as well on my vms and so if i right click here on this i also have that so excellent so this is available now so those packages were installed and if i run choco on my ansible vm i'm going to see that output there which is great and now in my chocolatey server if i refresh the chocolatey central management here i should see the ansible vm show up so that's great all three platforms worked and we had our check-in uh, and if we run that playbook or the configuration or the manifest again we're going to see no change so that's exactly what we expected so this is great okay so back in the slides now back from the demo you saw how on all three vms we were able to configure the chocolatey for business feature set and have it check into central management and even see those packages installed and in the context menus available so let's hop in and give you some of those resources that I mentioned earlier. So Ansible resources that are available for you. Ansible for DevOps by Jeff Geerling is a great book and you can find it at that web URL and also Become Ansible by Josh Duffney and that's available via Gumroad. Now these URLs will be available in my repo as well. Don't worry about it later. You don't have to copy it down. In addition to that, I will actually also contact these authors to see if I can get discount codes for you. So at least for one of them, I'm pretty sure I can. So if I do, then I'm going to drop a link, future me, in the chat over here. So look out for that for sure, because those are great books to read if you want to get your hands uh, wet or your feet dirty. So Josh Duffney is actually part of the PowerShell crew. Puppet resources, you have Puppet Forge, of course, where a lot of Puppet modules are available. So there's first party modules as well as community mo supported modules available up there. Chocolatey modules available up there as well. The Puppet Learning VM is a great way to get started with Puppet. So it's available at puppet.com slash try Puppet and Puppet Learning VM. The Puppet Community Slack is a great place to go to get your questions answered. They have office hours there as well. And lastly, DSC resources. So the amazing DSC book, written by the marvelous Mincy Januszko and Don Jones himself is great. And it also is now an forever edition supported by the DSC community. The DSC community itself, dscommunity.org, is a great resource to connect with other uh, DSC community folks. Uh, and so you can also attend their uh, monthly DSC community call as well if you want to be a part of that. Also, they have a DSC community Slack, which is a part of the PowerShell Slack in a certain channel for DSC. So feel free to chime in there and join in and ask questions. So some conclusions for you. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive comparison because there's no way I could include other big, big contenders in the field like Chef and like SaltStack. But again, these are not the ones we deal with regularly. So not the ones I have personal experience with in that field. So in addition to that, there are no winners and losers in this comparison. The important thing to remember is, of course, um, it depends entirely on your use case. So I can only give you some suggestions based on my research and experience so far. So what are those? If you have simple configuration you want to do uh, with PowerShell to your endpoint nodes and you're only using Windows and you want to go for low cost and let's say your environment is mostly Azure, then a great option would be DSC, That's what we've learned. If you have advanced tooling and configurations that you need and you need a cross-platform supported tool and you have a large fleet of VMs or workstations that you're supporting, then probably a good idea to look at Poppet as we've seen. Now, if you're still looking for cross-platform, but your focus is on simplicity and getting up and running quickly, and you want a pipeline-friendly, lightweight tool with a great web dashboard as well, then I would look at the Ansible automation platform for that specifically. And one more honorable mention here, if you have servers and workstations that you're trying to manage in a uh, relatively state maintenance manner, then if you, as long as those endpoints are Azure AD joined, and you're working with the sort of remote workforce that all of us are now with the pandemic, then you can utilize Microsoft Endpoint Manager. I would take a serious look at that because MEM has evolved now with uh, SCCM and MECM now and Intune to the point where I feel like they're making real strides there. There's still a long ways to go for some parts of it, but I feel like they're making some good progress in that field. So definitely keep an eye out for that if you are an admin that has to manage workstations and servers. And again, thank you so much for your time. I know this ran a little bit long, but please feel free to reach out on Twitter and GitHub. I'm on all the socials and uh, 
I'm also uh, usually in the PowerShell Discord whenever uh, I can. And if you ever need to talk about chocolatey stuff and chocolatey for business, again, reach out to anybody at Chocolatey, but ha I'm happy to talk about that too, or configuration managers, or should just shoot the breeze about PowerShell anytime. So thanks so much for your time, folks. Hope you have an amazing rest of your summit. Bye now.